We are close to the end of our main debate, and I will give you my valedictory. I would like to share my perspective. I would like to share my perspective as a social scientist, arms control practitioner, and defense strategist on the revival of soft power, which is very interesting here, and cultural diplomacy and its role in US foreign policy. <clears throat> of course, soft power and cultural diplomacy is not new in the area of foreign policy. A few centuries ago, in Europe, monarchies were building empires put into marriage, and many made fine artists and musicians travel distances to buy their goods, sometimes bringing new political ideas and cultural norms with them. I was proud to serve in a Reagan administration during which we helped end the Cold War, sometimes using traditional hardline power. Perhaps surprisingly to some, Ronald Reagan was in many ways rooted in a whole of cultural diplomacy. He was an actor by training, as you all know, who believed strongly in certain core American values and tried very hard to persuade others within the United States and the world of the wisdom of those core values. He believed strongly in making personal connections with world leaders and valued communication with overseas audiences. My own entrance into the world of defense policy was through the social sciences. I came to the United States from Switzerland during the immediate post-World War II, the Second World War period, and had the privilege of studying demography and sociology at the University of Chicago. My first work that I wrote was entitled The Social Impact of Bomb Destruction. Although the physical and biological impacts of a nuclear attack had already been studied, my research focused on the functioning <clears throat> of society, the lives of city inhabitants, the operation of industry, and future organizational strategies for cities that faced destruction. I examined cities in Germany, Poland, and Japan, and found that the inhabitants often rebuilt the cities with similar spacing and demographic characteristics to what had been there before the wartime destruction. Examining post-war Nagasaki views from our theme of soft power. But my half-century-old studies may still indicate how slowly people are changing some of their basic living patterns. Perhaps studies are being done today on the social patterns emerging from the destruction caused by the earthquake in Haiti and the rebuilding of Port au Prince in its capital since the earthquake of one year ago. The challenges ahead, whether it is removing the Taliban communities along the Pakistan border or relocating the environmental refugees created by global warming, must be informed by the challenges in many social changes societal changes, whether it be religious norms, farming practices, or village locations. <clears throat> Our foreign policy is more complicated today than it was before the Second World War and the destruction of Nagasaki. Before the end of World War II, the threat of nuclear weapons did not exist. There were no nuclear weapons. Now we must cope with nuclear proliferation to many countries, North Korea, Syria, Iran, what can we do? Famous scholars and senior government officials propose that all nations abolish nuclear weapons. That's called the idea of zero nukes. At first glance, this seems tempting, but careful analysis reveals many flaws. A treaty for zero nuclear weapons would be difficult to verify. And to create a nuclear-free world, would require powerful international organizations that, that enforce it. And we do not have such international organizations. But what has been possible is the non-use of nuclear weapons. Uh, are you aware of this? For 65 years, not a single nuclear weapon has been used. This dispensation of non-use 
is almost a miracle. Once a single nuclear weapon had been used, or were used now, the whole world would be gripped by anxiety and tension. Let us hope that no news will last indefinitely. It is an extraordinary phenomenon for uh, this time. The recent Senate ratification of the new Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, or STARC, which probably has read this in the newspaper, provided a mix of our US foreign policy objectives to support a potentially emergent democracy in Russia, a nuclear strategic, obje a nuclear strategic objectives <coughs> of the land. President Obama made a strong and successful push for ratification of this treaty signed in April 2010, before the end of the lame duck session, which we now experienced, um, of the Senate, which just ended. It was ratified by a vote of 71 to 26 on December 22nd, 2010. This ratific ratification was the cornerstone of President Obama's attempt to improve us russian relations. Can we support, support Russia's President Medvedev to rule Russia as a democracy? Or will Putin try to become a dictator like Stalin? Negotiating arms control agreements with Russia is a multifaceted task. And reaching agreement on limits of the number of weapons, missiles, and bombers absorbs most of the time. But numbers are not the key issue. Deterrence is more important for which a few more or less bombs do not matter. And deterrence is harder to maintain in a multipolar world, however. Mm. Managing technology is one of the challenges mm. we will continue to face in the future. <clears throat> My most recent book entitled Annihilation from Within focused on the inherent mismatch between technological progress and our foreign policy. Soft power and cultural diplomacy may help in crafting more consensus, but I fear that the political world will lag behind the developments in the scientific world. Science will move faster. Science and technology do not have a final goal. They pursue a continuing understanding of the nature in which disproved theories are replaced by new knowledge. Scientific progress has brought us many riches and improvements in our well-being, but it has also led to the dispersion of destructive tools. Preparing, preparing to cope with the risks of future biological <coughs> weapons or a nuclear weapon or cyberspace computer threats requires new natural security concepts that must be developed before the onslaught appears. Some potentially worrisome elements of a future threat might be, one, very few people would be needed to carry out the attack. For example, a single individual could spread the nationwide pandemic using a highly contagious virus. Second, if the attack has been properly planned and carried out, the US, the American government, our government may not know for whom sometime in due cost it. We may not know for some time who caused it. Third, the very nature of the attack and the possibility of follow-on attacks will demand instant responses by the government officials. The legitimacy of our past attack, the, the legitimacy of our post-attack government will be at stake in this response since signs of uncertainty could trigger the downward spiral of political disintegration. Based on this scenario, some of my recommendations would include the following. As a nuclear strategist, I would emphasize, as a nuclear strategist, I would emphasize that we need to develop and deploy tools to detect nuclear bombs. We need to assure continuity of the US government to provide for mobilization laws. Such laws would be needed to restore law and order and strengthen the country's security in the event of a national emergency. 
perhaps the most important tool for preparing for a worst case scenario is building unity among the American people. In the decades that have passed between writing my first book and my last, the world changed from one with more centralized power and control to one with decentralized power and decentralized control. In addition, the problems facing the world increasingly required broader consensus and cooperation. We have made great strides with cooperation in areas such as health, which may be addressed by other speakers here. There is less fruitful cooperation in areas of climate change, biodiversity, and overpopulation. Ultimately, these important areas will shape the future and require the development of a new consensus that must spread to government and individual actions. The growth of technology creates heightened uncertainty, but also may provide a future solution to pressing problems. The spread of democratic ideas is critical to supporting the political progress needed to manage the challenge we face. One non-governmental institution that started in 1983 and enjoys wide bipartisan support is the National Endowment for Democracy. They carry out important work in approximately 90 countries, supporting democratic groups, trade unions, and electoral processes. I would recommend continued support of organizations such as the National Endowment for Democracy to help bolster the objectives of the Obama administration in fostering a more decentralized and democratic world. We are certainly no longer in a world of five great powers, Great like Britain, France, the United States, Italy, and Japan. That meant in 1919 at President Wilson's Paris Conference. We are in a world of diffuse military, political, religious, and economic power. We are also in a world where consumer power and individual choices make an enormous difference. However, let us not forget how the world of the five great powers failed us. The most recent global catastrophe was the Second World War. And as we all know, the dictator liable for that war was Adolf Hitler. But historians know that the First World War led to the Second World War. Although Woodrow Wilson entered Paris with a triumphal reception, the Versailles Treaty he negotiated made the Germans furious and gave Adolf Hitler pretense to prepare for the Second World War. Which is true. He was in the, uh, among the soldiers in the First World War and he prepared for the Second World War. He started writing his book, Mein Kampf. The nations which fought from the beginning in the Second World War had valid reasons. But the reasons why half a dozen nations started the First World War were insignificant. Namely, in 1914, Archduke Ferdinand, Franz Ferdinand of Austria was assassinated. But the Austrian government blamed Serbia for the assassination and instantly declared war on Serbia without trying first to negotiate a settlement. <coughs> then seven nations in the frenzy declared war against each other. Really crazy. Listen to that. Germany declared war on Russia. Germany declared war on France. Britain declared war on Germany. Japan declared war on Germany. Turkey ended the war. Russia declared war on Turkey. Britain and France declared war on Turkey. The United States declared war on Germany. The German Emperor Kaiser Wilhelm II was largely responsible for the catastrophe of World War I. He built up a German Navy which became a threat to England and other nations. And this hostile confrontation might well have triggered the outbreak of the war. Here we are a few lessons from my dear tour to the last century of history. Democracies that have achieved the military victory ought to refrain from seeking revenge. Taking revenge is a Neanderthal theory. Instead of giving priority to a policy that can transform the defeated enemy in an ally, the revenger helps the hawks on the enemy side to include angry fighters who will undermine the peace settlement. 
or in the case of today's more decentralized power structures, it may help fringe fanatics to build a terrorist force. Another principle essential for turning a military victory into lasting political success has to do with the prestige of the victor's forces. And uh, it has to maintain it among the defeated population. For instance, in the spring of 2003, at the start of the war in Iraq, that was not long ago, the morning after all of Saddam Saddam's statues had tumbled in dust, the American forces seemed 10 feet tall to many Iraqis. From what the Iraqis people had seen, they came to believe the American military could find the target day or night and hit it, could rapidly repair the electric system and water supply which they promised to prepare and would be the new saving force to maintain law and order effectively and justly. A day, a day, or, two, a day or two later, later, when mobs of looters ran through the streets in Baghdad, these proud, all-powerful American forces looked sheepishly and did nothing to kill this incipient uprising. The looters not only emptied the museums, and shops, but they also stole office supplies from the government buildings that were needed for restoring the functioning of the administration, <coughs> and even gathered intelligence documents that would have been invaluable for tracking down future troublemakers. This episode is the extreme opposite of cultural diplomacy. America lost most of its prestige in respect in that episode. I hope this history will inform decision makers in the current Obama administration, as well as others, people like you. In closing the challenges <coughs> we face in the coming years, in, in closing the challenges we face in the coming years, will benefit from increased development of the tools of soft diplomacy. We also need to address some of the challenges posed by technological advances and the benefits of such technology for supporting cooperation. Future threats may come from many sources, so we need to use a variety of tools, such as cultural exchanges to foster better understanding. We also need an increased meaningful engagement with the international community, as our common future depends on all, all our actions. Thank you.